you're going to be wanting to run direct tests, very intentional tests that are meant to illustrate an objective that you've outlined before you even start the campaign. You don't want to be going in there and doing something reactionary. You want to have this plan before you get into it. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Creative Juice. I am Corinne Campbell, and with me is Jack McCarthy. How are you doing on this lovely August day, Jack? Doing great. Uh, and excited to be here and continue this little arc that we've been we've been going over. Super pumped. Yeah. Yeah, we're about to wrap it, actually. So this is going to be the last of our little arc about permission. Uh, and it's not because we haven't talked about it too much. It's just that <laughs> we got other things to talk about. But uh, I think that this is something that, of course, I'm very passionate about this because Indie Founder Permission Splinter I've obviously talked a lot about that uh, in that splinter, but also this is a thing that so many indies struggle with. So I'm really glad that we've had this opportunity to really take a deep dive into it, take a look at the different things that you can tweak about your offers and your branding and how this all works. But then when it comes down to it, sometimes when permission campaigns don't work, it's just a problem with your ads, right? And so being able to diagnose those things I think we've spoken about that quite a few times on this podcast is that we're not just trying to teach you a rule book or a one, two, three checklist. This is about having you critically think about what's happening so that you can make pivots and changes in order to make sure you're not wasting money. So I'm excited about this. I know, Jack, you spend so much time in ads with IndieX, but specifically permission campaigns you must spend a lot of time doing stuff like this. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's just, you know, there's a whole world of advertising when it comes to the permission stage of the buddy system because there's so many different variables going on, different looking ads, different kinds of creatives, not to mention the myriad of, of offers that you can run. And hopefully throughout this arc, um, you guys listening kind of got some brain fuel to think about the different kinds of offers that you can use to build up your list. That was kind of the the purpose of this whole arc was to get you guys thinking creatively and let you inside of our minds a little bit. But the ad space when it comes to permission is really important. So I'm hoping in this episode, we can talk a little bit about structuring your campaigns and how to, how to know, you know, when to test versus when to tweak and what you need to be looking for as you're building out ad campaigns and running them. Right. And I think that's something that we talk in, you know, inside entrepreneur, we talk all the time about how people are messing with their ads. <laughs> right. Yep. And there's a very big difference between tweaking an ad and being like, oh, this didn't do what I wanted in the first two hours. So I'm just going to do this and uh, making changes on the fly that sometimes those things are necessary. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But most of the time, you're going to be wanting to run direct tests, very intentional tests that are meant to illustrate an objective that you've outlined before you even start the campaign. You don't want to be going in there and doing something reactionary. You want to have this plan before you get into it. So um, one of the things that I know, you know, some indies get confused about, Jack, is that obviously when we're running the fan finder, we have different audiences that we're testing against each other. And, you know, once you get into permission, we're looking at warm traffic. Yeah. So in that case, you know, what are the things that you test at that point? It's like, well, this is everybody who's warm. Do you see a reason to segment those people or how do you test that kind of, you know, situation? That's such a good starting point question because that was exactly what I wanted to lead with. You know, <laughs> as Facebook gets smarter and smarter um, in terms of how it how it finds your audience in and when I say your audience, I mean your target audience inside the audience that you give it at the ad set level when you're when you're putting together a campaign. Um, as Facebook gets smarter and smarter, it's getting better and better at finding the people that are going to be most likely to convert for the objective that you're asking them to do. So, you know, when you're putting together a, a 
campaign at the permission stage of the buddy system, generally speaking, you know, as a starting point, um, if you've got a, a decently sized audience, you're probably going to be shooting for a conversions campaign objective, likely using a custom conversion or the lead standard event. Now that's getting a bit into the nitty gritty here, but where I'm going with this <laughs> is lumping in all of your warm audiences into one ad set is usually my kind of general starting point. That way you're giving Facebook enough of a sizable audience at the ad set level so they can one, deliver your ads and then within those custom audiences uh, have enough people to be able to determine, okay, within this audience that Corinne gave me, uh, Facebook knows that there are a certain subset of them that are likely to convert. Um, If you give it too small of audiences and you try to break it out into, you know, just video viewers or, uh, you know, just, just 25% views versus just 75% views of like a fan finder, for example, you might be giving Facebook more of a challenge than you need to, um, as opposed to just putting together what we call like an all warm, uh, targeted ad set and starting there. So Facebook's gotten really smart in that way. Um, so as a starting point, I almost always recommend, building out your kind of like your just general warm audience is starting there. So not a whole lot of testing going on in that way, at least as you uh, kick things off. Right. I think that's something too that needs to be considered is that when we start talking about targeting different warm audiences and running conversion campaigns, if you don't have a lot of warmth, that's not giving Facebook much to calculate off of. Totally. Right. And if you're running a conversions campaign for leads, right, if you're going for leads, um, especially, you know, we don't necessarily recommend the Facebook ad leads <laughs> uh, the way that they do leads. We actually usually go to conversion and leads unless, Jack, have you changed your mind on that nope. <laughs> since we've talked about changing our minds lately? Nope, 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 okay. nope. <laughs> generally so we generally speaking, not using lead forms. Right. So Facebook ad lead forms is not what we're looking at. We're looking at conversions for leads, which are tracked on your site. Now, the thing about that is that conversion campaigns are, you know, recommended to have at least 50 of whatever you're asking it to do a week. So if you are running to a smaller audience, uh, it's going to take longer for Facebook to find just the exact people in that audience to equal 50 opt-ins per week. Uh, Whereas if you give them a nice big audience, it can do, it can kind of suss out more folks. So I think that's something that, you know, a lot of indies will you know, run these permission campaigns or they'll launch something and then they'll see that little learning limited uh, Mm -hmm. error on their ad set or it's a warning, not an error. That little yellow triangle. No, that little yellow triangle. I ignore most yellow triangles because they tend to clear themselves, but that's one that I do not ignore because that means that your audience is not doing enough for Facebook to optimize properly. Yep. So it's important that, you know, you give Facebook a bigger audience so that it understands like, okay, these are the people I'm looking for, right? Once I get a few people, I know even more about who I'm looking for and I can kind of suss through this audience. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's definitely something I think that, you know, I see a lot of indies kind of slip up in that department because they're trying to go conversion. So you need to get 50 of those a week and a bigger audience is going to support being able to do that. Totally. Yeah. And when it comes to testing, you know, since we're, since we're talking about here, you know, taking all of your warm audiences and kind of combining them into a nice big ad set for your campaign. What we look at when it comes to testing then are things like your ad creatives, your copy, um, and then your images and your videos that you might use uh, in those ads. That's really where the the starting point when it comes to the kinds of testing that you should be looking at come into play. Yeah, I think that's something too that even as you get further, and I know I'm jumping ahead a little, but when I'm running campaigns and I start to see the audience fatigue a bit and it's not doing as many conversions as I'd like, that's when I start bringing in other ads, right? So I don't change the ad set. I don't change any settings. The only thing I do is just add some other creatives in the ad section. And that helps me kind of figure out like, okay, is this audience not working? Or is it that the creative that I'm presenting is just not triggering them properly? So um, usually I try to have that creative set up ahead of time, right? Where like I have three options ready to go if I need to. Uh, but every once in a while, like there's a campaign that I'm running right now 
that I was like, okay, this is ad did really well, but now the audience is starting to fatigue. I need to change it up. And I did a little refresh. Um, I basically took the video and I trimmed it to make it shorter. And then I uploaded just kind of a remix of the original video. And all of a sudden, you know, more conversions are popping through. So this is the kind of stuff that you can test. And if you're already in it, you can still test these things uh, without having to make major changes to your campaign, um, which, you know, that's, I think, where we get into testing versus tweaking. Right, Jack? Yeah, totally. So can you explain the difference between tweaking and testing? Like when is this wise and when is it like not so great? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So when it comes to the permission stage, right? Building campaigns for a, for a bribe of some kind. I think it's helpful to think about uh, your offers in kind of two different buckets here. You might have uh, an offer that has the potential to be evergreen um, and something that can run continuously. So that could look like uh, potentially like a recurring content kind of bribe where you're getting people to sign up for your list so that they're in the loop about, you know, maybe when you go live next or as soon like your next single that's going to drop. And of course, you've built out uh, a ton of bonus value and content into those. But that would be something that would look more like your evergreen style permission offer, whereas mm. something more live uh, and time limited, such as like an album launch where, you know, it's it's happening in a given window of time. Those are kind of like your two buttons buckets of offer types. When it comes to structuring tests and building out your campaigns and how to look for, you know, success metrics in these variables, um, things that are live tend to fall a little bit more under a tweaking kind of mentality. Um, whereas mm -hmm. evergreen sort of offers or offers that could be evergreen if they're going well, um, they fall into more of a, you know, a methodical uh, testing sort of campaign structure that you can use and then right. make them better and better. Yeah. And so that said, what are the times that you've seen? Uh, so let's dig into this, right? Because testing is good, right? Especially when it's intentional. Tweaking is good when it's intentional, right? Which I mean, Jack's kind of outlined what those are. So just so that we can kind of illustrate this, what are some bad tests and some really bad tweaking that you've seen? Yeah. So bad tests. Let's let's start there. <laughs> I think I think a bad test is a test. Well, and, and maybe this is, you know, blanketing a little bit here, but I think a bad test doesn't have a defined goal or a defined right. idea in mind. It doesn't have really a variable that you're testing, right? You don't really know what you're looking for, what kind of questions you want to answer with that test. That makes a test almost use almost useless <laughs> because yeah. once you complete the test, what answers are you deriving from it if you don't even have questions? Um, mm. So I think a bad test is one that you don't have questions about um, or questions for. So, you know, a good test would look like, okay, I've set, I've set up a campaign. I've got, I'm targeting my warm audience for my permission offer. Let's say, uh, let's say like your, you know, your early access recurring content bribe. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to know, uh, I want to know which creatives, which kind of creatives and which copy are going to yield me the cheapest cost per lead over the course of two weeks time. And I'm going to spend a dedicated amount of budget to do that and gauge my success based on that. That is a, a well-defined, well-structured test because you know, right. at the en you know at the end that you want to be looking at your top performing creatives and potentially call out the ones that are not working well and take the ones that are and turn them into a or put them into a scaling kind of campaign potentially. That's that's like a solid test. And that's that's the thing is that I have been running a, a few different kind of new strategies that are not really part of, you know, our training. Um, but I've been testing out a few different things lately. And one thing that I've noticed is that I even me. Right. And I've been in the ads manager for as long as it has been alive. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and I've been running ads for a very, very long time. But even I, when I'm doing something new, when I'm trying something new, if it doesn't do what I want it to in like 48 hours, <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know if it's working. <laughs> I do that. You know what I mean? So yep. you have to like keep yourself from doing that. And I think that that is something 
that a lot of indies struggle with is like, wait, did I misstep? Am I doing this right? Is it wrong? Like it just takes time for the machine to learn what you're looking for, especially if it's, you know, a new campaign from what you've run before, whether it's a different objective from what you've run before. Yeah. So essentially, if you are trying out a new thing, something you haven't done before, right? If you've never run leads before, if you've never run for purchases before, anytime that you're doing something that's new, you really have to resist the urge to make early judgments about it, right? Like the example that Jack just gave was like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it for two weeks, right? Like yeah. how, I don't leave anything for two weeks, but you should leave things for two <laughs> weeks, you know? That's the thing. I can't even, you know, keep myself to that kind of test. So now obviously if you're going for something less like video views or simple engagement, you don't need to wait two weeks to figure that out. Right. Um, you don't even need usually to wait 48 hours for to figure that out. Usually it'll you know, it won't give you what your consistent results will be over time, but it'll give you some results. Whereas when you're going for leads, emails, right? If you're trying to get people to sign up with their email, it might take that ad a week to find those people. It might take them two weeks to find those people. Yeah. So I think that's something that it's, I guess what I'm saying is like, I empathize. Even when I launch things, I want to mess with them if they don't instantly get me the results that I want but you just gotta wait, you know? And so the first couple of days you might be like, I'm spending all this money and nothing's happening. But like, it'll, you know, like you don't really know unless you let it go for a little while. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. And I think it, it, on that note, it's important to mention, you know, what you were talking about with Facebook's learning, uh, learning period and optimization. Um, it takes, you know, 50 conversions in seven, that, that learning period goes over the course of seven days. So for Facebook right. really to stabilize what you're doing um, and what you're, what you're trying to achieve, it's going to need that, those 50 conversions over that seven day window to really start making your ads perform optimally and continue to mm. perform optimally. So mm -hmm. that kind of just underlies the point even more, I think of, you know, allowing yourself to run the tests that you need to run. Now, when it comes to things like tweaking, you know, where you're running like a, a, oh, a, la man. a launch kind of campaign, I think that this, this also kind of comes into play as well, because even if you're running a campaign where you know, like, okay, I've got a dedicated amount of time uh, to make this happen before, you know, before the, the doors close or whatever, um, you still have to let Facebook the ads platform do its work and let the machine learning do the thing that it's good at. Um, right. I think often, you know, as marketers, we try to outsmart Facebook. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I would just say to that, don't, um, <laughs> don't, right, right. don't try to outsmart it because the platform is just gathering so much data constantly from advertisers all around the world. Um, so when it comes to things like tweaking, you know, let Facebook do its thing for three days before you decide to touch it. That's kind of like my, my internal, uh, I don't, I don't push this on anybody else at the, at the agency or anything, but my <laughs> internal clock is like, turn a Facebook campaign on, like I'll look at it over those three days and make sure that it's not spinning out of control, especially if I'm spending a lot of money. But right. You know, when it comes to making tweaks on things that are time sensitive, like I'll let them be for, you know, two or three days before I, before I look and say like, okay, what can I be changing here and why? Um, right. I kind of have a don't touch it policy. Um, yeah. I had to create one of those for myself. It only works sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think that that's, you know, when it comes to bad tweaking, it's, um, it's, it's changing things or tweaking things too soon after you launch them uh, initially and then trying to make rapid fire tweaks like changing right. copy, changing images, changing audiences, swapping out placements, changing your countries and doing all of those things all at once. That is going to be a catastrophe <laughs> for your yeah. camp for your campaign because you're telling Facebook to change a million different things all at once. One, you have no, then no variable to go off of, right? We talked about like right. testing different variables. Oftentimes when you're making tweaks to a campaign, it's in your best interest to only be changing one. And I would say at most two things, if you've really got like a, a strong hypothesis as to, you know, if there's more than one thing that, that might be causing an issue, um, 
or working you towards better optimization. Um, otherwise, you're kind of working blind with what actually resulted in a better result or a worse result after the fact. So changing right. things too fast, changing too many things at once, and then expecting results to come in based on those changes too quickly. And then the cycle of evil tweaking kind of repeats itself, right? Like yeah. you make a tweak and you're like, okay, now I wait for the results. And you, you sit there with like biting your nails, <laughs> waiting for those change, <laughs> waiting for those changes to happen. And you know, you just reset the learning, uh, phase for Facebook. So now it's gotta, it's gotta re-optimize. Um, right. That's something I've seen as a mistake as well as when people do want to go in there are some changes that you can make to the thing that's running right now. But if what's running right now is giving you zero results and you feel the need to go in and change a whole lot of variables, don't do it in the ad set that's currently running. Like if you want to change your audience and like change up your countries and do all these different things, like create a different ad set, yeah. you know, yeah. and like don't mess with what you got because at least you have the data of the success or failure of what was running and you can now set up another ad set to include some variables. But, you know, it's just the scientific method, right? Yep. If you go Google that, you'll find out more about like what it takes to actually build a hypothesis and then to prove said hypothesis, right? And one of the key elements is not changing too much at one time because then you have no idea what actually brought about the change either that you didn't want or that you did, <laughs> you know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's very difficult to isolate. And then you, you've learned nothing and you spent a lot of money, you know? Uh, so that's a common mistake I see is Indy's going in and changing the audience that's currently running in the ad set that's been running. Um, and it, you might as well just set up a new ad set because Facebook's going to re-optimize and relearn anyway. So just totally. set up a new one. <laughs> yeah. Then you have very clear cut data um, mm -hmm. based on the changes that you made. And actually that, that leads me to something that I wanted to bring up here that uh, has been going on and that I've been working towards in the upcoming permission marketing training um, that mm -hmm. we're going to be, ha that we're going to be releasing shortly is uh, when it comes to structured tests, something that that we use at IndieX a lot and that I recommend to Indies when they're running uh, permission offers and, and trying to, you know, build up their list is look towards doing, you know, putting 100 leads into your funnel when you're running your first test, you know, commit to a hundred people in so that you've got a full cohort of people that are going through. And this is especially crucial when it comes to if you've got a sales offer on the back end of that opt-in campaign, because, totally. you know, if you send two or three people or, or 10 or 15 people in, and you know, maybe you're getting a good cost per lead and that's great, but that really doesn't give you a picture of what's going to be happening as you drive more and more people into it. So I say, you know, starting with a hundred, a hundred leads test and using that kind of as your first cohort of people that are, that are coming into for this content and getting offer exposure. If you've got a sales offer on the back end, that will give you, you know, a hundred people to look at and be like, okay, how is everything going here? How is the engagement with the content happening? What is my cost per lead looking like? Um, as I bring more people into this, as I run more traffic on it, what is my sales conversion rate? If I'm trying to make sales, am I able to subsidize a little bit? Am I able to subsidize a lot? Am I profitable? Am I losing money? What do, what does all of this look like based on, you know, a sizable amount of people, because then you can make better informed decisions than if you were just kind of doing it on the go. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just like, if we make a lookalike audience, right? Like totally. If yeah. Facebook can do more with a lookalike of a thousand people, then it can do with a lookalike of, you know, five people. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. Like you want to give Facebook more data. And in the same way, you and your brain want more data also. So you can kind of observe the things that a machine doesn't learn, right? Like right. how your fans engage with you after that campaign comes around and how they respond to you continuing to talk with them. You know, do they send themselves to a purchase? Is there a particular offer that you're making to them that can help them kind of move along in the process? Are they taking a lot of work, you know? And so those are the kinds of things that the algorithm cannot optimize for. That's not something a machine will learn for you. Right. So uh, that's something that you want to think about is like the more of these people that you can get in, which I mean, all of us want 
more fans. All of us want more people on our mailing list, right? But if you're thinking about it with the objective in mind that you're going to learn something that's going to make you better, it has a whole other kind of motivation behind it, which I think is it, it makes you smarter about the decisions that you make and it's less emotional. Whereas when we feel like we don't have enough people as musicians, like nobody likes my stuff. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. Like, but, you know, value the people who do like your stuff, you know, and take as much data from those people as you can. Right. Yeah. So speaking of talking with fans after a campaign goes right, say you get those hundred opt ins and they go through like your experience or whatever. Um, one mistake I see indies make is that then they're like, I already put all my content in that. That's the only thing I know how to do. I'm done. <laughs> you know. And then they don't continue to talk to people and they just kind of fall off the radar. And then they're surprised when people don't open their emails anymore. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, so what are some ways that you've seen, you know, at the agency level or, you know, tell us a little bit more about nurturing, because I think the nurturing center of the buddy system is a phase that we come back to. It's like a clover leaf, right? We do, we do introduction and we come into nurturing and we go to education, come back into nurturing and we get a lead and we go back into nurturing and they make a purchase and we continue nurturing. Right. So yeah. I think nurturing is something that indies struggle with a lot. Like, what do I say? What do I do? What are the things that are, are supposed to be happening? So how would you answer that? Well, that's so, it's such an interesting uh, phenomenon that we, that we see kind of, in the music world that nurturing is something that feels foreign to people, especially at the permission stage, because they're like, I don't know what to email my fans about, or, uh, right. you know, I used up all my content making this, making this opt-in experience and making it cool. And I don't know what to say next. It's really interesting because on the flip side, I often hear from, from artists like, I just want people to see my content. I just need yeah. to get my I just need to get my content out there. I've got so much content and I want to just give people value. But then when it yeah. when push comes to shove, it's like, okay, well, where's that content that you wanted so desperately to give to right. people? Oh, it was just these two videos of content that I wanted everyone to see and right. then I was done. Right. So <laughs> I think there is a little bit of a hang up there. Um, right. So I, I mean, I always encourage people to, when it comes to nurturing at, at this stage, after the opt-in, um, after mm -hmm. the sign up, like there's two kinds of nurturing to think about here. Like you've got your automated nurturing, which is what's happening, you know, right after the opt-in. And that might look like, uh, delivered content over a few days. It might look like uh, recurring content delivered over, over weeks or even months. Um, it might mm -hmm. just look like uh, continued engagement when you go live. That could look like right. any, any, you know, wide uh, expanse of things. Um, and then you've got your uh, your hand to hand kind of manual nurturing, and that's keeping people in the loop with what you're doing, um, mm -hmm. sending them behind the scenes things as you're working on them, treating your list like a place where people actually want to be a little more exclusive than just what might be going on kind of in your public facing world on your socials or whatever. Um, right. Just giving them that little bit of extra from time to time and, you know, letting them in. Um and like I said, that could look like a lot of things that could look like uh, discount codes that could look like sales promotions. It should look like sales promotions that I'm always beating a dead <laughs> horse on that, but it should look like sales promotions. Jack um, is triggered. Yeah. Yeah. You <laughs> warning, got me. Warning. <laughs> <laughs> the camera goes red. Um, <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, but then it can look like, you know, it can look like content. It can be updates about new things that you're working on. It can be uh, behind the scenes things in the studio. Uh, the creativity is really uh, up to you and kind of the sky's the limit there. But I think really committing committing to it is is important. I agree. And that's one thing I've had a lot of, with some tests I've been running, I've had a lot of new people coming into my ecosystem lately. And one thing I've been really grateful for is that I've had a lot of stuff set up. So one, okay, so a little offshoot, an entrepreneur, we have an organizational chart and, you know, we don't have a crap ton of employees, right? We're, we're less than a dozen people full strength uh, with a couple of contractors. And so, but we have this organizational chart that Circa built that is for when we have 
a zillion people. <laughs> um, and one of the roles in there, I mean, and so we're all wearing multiple hats, you know, um, Jack's doing multiple things, Cirque is doing multiple things, I'm doing multiple things. Um, so, but one of the roles that I am not officially entitled with, but end up doing a lot of is a role called the automator, which first off, Sounds badass, but it also yeah. has a lot. It's a lot to do with data and customer history and mailing list objectives and a lot of different things. And, um, you know, I've had drip. I, I've talked about that recently. I migrated my mailing list to drip uh, probably within the last three or four weeks. And when I first set it up, it was good, right? I was like, oh yeah, this is kind of like MailChimp. And I set up things that looked like MailChimp in my MailChimp way of thinking and everything was working fine. And then when I had to do it for entrepreneur, it got a little bit more complex mm. <laughs> because we're, you know, we're over 10,000 subscribers easy. Um, I think it's more like in the 17,000 range. And we've got, you know, pro members and we have NDX clients and we have non-pro members, you know, basic members. And then we have people who've never bought anything. And so there's a lot more complex segmentation going on and uh, figuring out how they all talk to each other and then what happens, right, can be complicated. So I started learning Liquid, which I've talked about before. I hate working in Liquid. I'm not Ooh. good at it. Gives yeah. me the shivers. <laughs> I know. I'm not good at it. Shopify is built in liquid and Drip also uses liquid. And you know, if you're kind of if you're kind of nerdy and you want to learn some code, definitely learn liquid. You'll be employed forever. But um, but I have learned some of it now. And one thing that I learned, and I know I said this was an offshoot, I'm bringing it around, guys. I'm coming back. The <laughs> the super signature, which we've talked about before in email. Um, we've typically had to send different emails to different members or non-members uh, because the content is different. The signature is different. What we're saying in the email is different. And um, so when we send an email to announce that this podcast came out, we were having to send one to pro members that was talking to them as if they were pro members. And then we had one for non-pro members uh, talking to them as if, you know, they're not pro members. So, um, and there was just different, it, it was important to us to have that be a specialized experience when that goes out. Now with Drip, I was able to use liquid code to basically be like, okay, most of this content is the same, but these couple of things I want to show only if a person is this type of person. And once I figured out how to do that for entrepreneur, I figured out how to do that with my music stuff. So, um, and I'm all about automation, you know, I still do hand to hand combat. I'm still in Facebook messenger. I'm still emailing with fans. I constantly invite them to email me back, um, from a, you know, whether it's an order confirmation or an experience or whatever, but I've got my CC points bot, right. Which is a many chat flow where they can enter all kinds of information about themselves and, follow me on Instagram and participate just in general with some cool things to rack up points and claim a prize. And which is a hand, uh, it's a sticker pack and a handwritten note for me, which I don't tell them ahead of time. So don't tell any of my fans. Shh. <laughs> Shh. It's a secret, but, um, but I have that set up. And then I also have the Gilded experience, which I've talked about many times, which has been running for two and a half years now. Like it's just, it just keeps doing well for me. So um, now in my emails, every time, oh, and then I also have a TuneSpeak contest running. So these are three things that are working for me that I'm not having to actively do right now, right? I'm still sending emails, I'm still doing the current things, but it's a lot less heavy because there's all of these nurturing things built automated out there, right? So now in the bottom of my emails in this super signature, which, you know, I said a couple episodes ago, I've changed my mind about it. It's been very powerful. Using Liquid, I've been able to be like, all right, have they already signed up for TuneSpeak? Because I've, you know, got all the emails of people who signed up for TuneSpeak. Right. Have they, and then I tag them. And if they've already signed up for that, it doesn't show that to them. If yeah. they've already purchased something, I'll be like, hey, have you, you know, have you checked this out? I'm running a sale on this thing. If they already purchased it, it doesn't show them that. Have you been through the Gilded experience? If they've been through it, it doesn't show them that. But anybody who doesn't qualify for any of those things, bam, bam, bam. 
There's a whole bunch of things that are set up to nurture them and nurture them automatically. So I think setting up things like that can really help take the stress off of you from like, OMG, what am I going to post on IG today? You know, (laughs) Uh, I think that if you dedicate some time to that, you shouldn't just do that to like an album experience, right? At that point, first off, continue to use that experience, but also think about the things that you can generate to keep making these feel, these people feel like you're giving them something. Uh, And it's, it's not that hard once you just kind of lay that out. I mean, people are getting messages and emails from me every day that I have nothing to do with (laughs) that I did. And now I don't, (laughs) you know? Uh, So I think that's one way embrace your inner automator and figure out ways to continue to nurture those fans without having it to be an active thing you're doing every moment. Totally. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think that's where the commitment to nurturing really comes in is it's not only in creating content and, you know, delivering just in time kind of email campaigns to your fans, which you totally should do, but it's, mm-hmm. it's about committing to these deeper kind of automated things that you can have kind of just in your, in your tech stack, in your ecosystem that give fans the opportunity to go deeper if they want to. Um, right. And, and having that there, I think is, is really, really important, uh, post permission, right? Um, yeah. Cause you're well, not just it's trying almost like a second permission, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, who cares about double opt-in, <laughs> but yeah. double, double permission is great because if they sign up for one thing, I'm like, okay, yeah, that was cool. You know, and then you have another thing that they can sign up for and they do it again. You essentially just got that lead for nothing, yeah. right? Because if yep. you were about to run a campaign to get leads on that, now it's free. And that's yeah, a, sure. a constant conversation we have in Indie Founder as well. We go through essentially budgeting for a, like an ultimate album launch, right? Uh, We also go through budgeting for a fan finder, but when we're talking about the, you know, ultimate album launch kind of thing, we basically break out, okay, from fan finder video all the way down to opt-ins and estimations on purchase conversions and profit margins. And we look at the cost of goods on those things. Like we get in it. And one thing that scares the crap out of indies is they're like, whoa, this is what I would have to do for this to be profitable. And I'm like, yeah, "Yeah, okay. Now crank up your mailing list by 250 people. And they're like, whoa, it just got profitable. And that's the kind of stuff that I think indies don't realize is that you have this email list that you're working to gather. They are worth earning because they will totally change the next thing you do. So if you're at the first stage, if you're grassroots and you have very few people on your list, you know, chances are that that thing's not going to be profitable right away, but you have to consider the lifetime value of these people because totally. now for your next launch, you have 250 people that are just going to go through it and it costs you nothing. So that's where nurturing is not, it's not even just nurturing. It's also like permission level two, because it gives you a very good indicator of how much of a self-starter they are as a fan of your music, but it also saves you money so that you don't have to advertise to them again. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And I mean, we see this time and time again at Indie X as well with a lot of the artists that we work with is the nurturing is really the machine to the, you know, the post permission nurturing is really the machine that takes people who are coming onto your list and they signed up for something, but you know, it might have just been the uh, it might have just been one thing that they wanted to sign up for. Maybe they're really not you know that into you as an artist, and they're kind of just starting to tiptoe in. The nurturing is what takes those people from being a new list subscriber to a fan that actually looks for your emails and wants to engage and wants to take the next step. And beyond that, it's also like the customer LTV maximizer, really. Nurturing is what does that. Nurturing is what takes someone from being a fan who bought something for $5, maybe at the, maybe in, in a, in a sales promo that you ran to them or in a a post permission kind of affirmation offer, whatever it might be. Um, Mm -hmm. that might be what took them from, you know, being a tripwire level customer to down the line, someone who wants to come out to a festival that you're playing at or, or hosting and, and pay, you know, a lot of money to see you. Um, right. Exactly. That's what, that's what nurturing does. It's that, it's that maximizing element. So keep that in mind. I think as you're, as you're working to build up your list and understand that, you know, while certainly it's a goal to be doing so 
at break even or profit, um, keep in mind that it's not just about building, you know, it's not about a one-time purchase here. Right. Right. And you know, it's interesting because I've been going through this lately with some testing. Um, and I sent out a free plus shipping and handling offer to all of my list that had no purchases. And I'm also running ads for free plus shipping and handling. And it's kind of amazing. Like how many people I I've talked about this before, but it's said to pay what you want. So they can pay me $0 or they can pay me $5. I've had people pay me $20, which is more than I even sold on my site. So thank you very much. But even people who buy it for $0, I had this one fan who just, she went bonkers. <laughs> she, she bought everything that was in the funnel, which I, you know, I had three CDs total available. I had two upsells on it. And then she, you know, messaged me back and it was like, I just bought all three. Like she messaged me on Facebook and I got back to her right away. She was like, oh, you're from Minnesota too. This is so great. Cause she's up from the same state as me, which is a big state, but you know, whatever makes her feel, <laughs> you know, closer as a fan, I'm down for it, you know? And she has went and bought every version. I mean, I have Gilded and I have Gilded Limited Edition. I have Game Night, which was remastered in 2010 and I had some old copies of the 2009 which I don't even like the recordings I wouldn't even stand by them anymore but I have them and I bought them so long ago that I'm just like eh, whatever I'll just put them up she bought that she's like I can't wait till your EP your first EP comes back in stock because I do have those incoming what? she's literally yeah she bought two t-shirts so far she bought this keychain that I made that actually has not been selling very well. Like she's just, and it's like, she has six orders now and she came into my world two weeks ago. Mm. And I'm just like, whoa, you know? And most of the people have not done that, right? Yeah. Like it's not like the majority of people that are coming, you know, into my mailing list or into this funnel are doing that. But when one of them does, and there have been others that have done it not to that extreme, every time they make another purchase, you realize the power of that nurturing. If you just yeah. stay in touch with them, she's been back in my store every day. She tells me, she emails me. Wild. <laughs> she, yeah, she messaged me on Facebook. She's like, I was just in there and like I literally, I put, I found two extra copies of this game night that I'm not gonna reprint. And um, I, I put it up, uh, I put them up for 20 bucks and it'd been in there for like 15 minutes and she snapped one up. She's like, I got it. <laughs> you know? That's and I was awesome. Just like, it's like, I didn't send an announcement. I didn't tell anybody, although I was thinking of emailing her specifically to tell her because she's been so communicative, but she's in the store. And I'm like, she's looking in there regularly for new things. So these are the types of fans that you can generate if you just give them a little love, right? Again, yep. she's an outlier. I don't want to sit here and tell you that like every fan's going to turn into this but you're never going to know if you don't nurture them properly because they're not yeah. going to, you know, ever elevate. Um, so I think that's why nurturing is just so, so important and mm, totally develop as many things, like even the point system, uh, the point spot that I have set up. Yes. It's getting their text. Uh, it's getting their text number. It's getting their email. It's asking them if they want to join the tune speak contest. It's getting their location it is, you know, presenting all, it's getting an IG follow, it's getting a Spotify follow, you know, uh, it's gathering their streaming preference actually, which passes back over to Drip so that when I send out a new release, I'm using Liquid to send them the right link for anything that they've opted into. And then I have one general for people who haven't told me what they want to stream on. Yeah, um, right. So things like that can just really make people feel good. And then at the end they get a prize and that's further nurturing because I'm sending them a handwritten note with stickers in it, you know? Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's just amazing how you can gamify these things and, you know, set them up to be automated and it just helps these fans elevate faster and faster. So can you tell I care about nurturing? <laughs> <laughs> nurturing is like the glue of the buddy system. I could do a whole hour on nurturing and how important it is. I will stop lecturing you, but I, I practice what I preach and I highly encourage you to figure out ways to do it because it, it will change the scope of what you're trying to do with your music career. 
We'll have to, we'll definitely have to slate that for an episode. I think that that would be so much fun just to oh, deep man. dive, deep dive a little further into nurturing, but it really is. You like, want me to go further than I just did? <laughs> I think people will fall asleep. I love it though. I, I, it, it's so for me. And it, again, like some people are like, oh, how many people are actually like learning all this marketing stuff and doing the music? And I'm like me and yeah. it's, you know, and they're like, oh, but it's so much work. And I'm like, for me, it's fun. It's so yeah. fun to figure this stuff out. Um, so, you know, I don't want to preach to people who don't find it fun, but maybe you could try to find some fun in it and make it fun for yourself because it really can be. Totally. Yeah. I think like nurturing is the glue of the buddy system. And totally. I think, I think at the permission stage, especially like the nurturing portion that comes after is really what allows you to create those dream come true sort of experiences, um, mm -hmm. no matter what your bribe is. So really exactly. just committing to making that dope is, I think just, I consider it just a part of the permission stage. Like it's a, it's, right. it's something you have to do. Um, yeah. otherwise you just end up with a cold, stale, dead list that you're going to throw away anyway. Right. Well, what's the, what's the, who wants that? You know? Yeah. Um, so I What's think a, that's another thing for those of you who are thinking about nurturing after permission um, is, you know, when we get back into that super signature, what's great about it is that you can now write emails that are just like a little update, right? Yeah. You don't have to write a blog. You, <laughs> you can literally just be like, Hey, I hope you're having a great Saturday or whatever day it is that you're sending and be like, this is what's been happening this week. I just, you know, wanted you to know that, I'm working on this new music and I'd love your input on this thing, you know, whatever. But you've got this super signature in there that's got them ready to go. I have one. Um, I also, sorry, see, I'm going. I have. <laughs> Triggered. <laughs> I, I have a, funny enough, I have a trigger link. All, oh of God. My, <laughs> all of my super signatures are trigger links, which means that it automatically adds them to a tag in a workflow um, and it sends them just to the confirmation page that's on my site. They don't have to re-enter their email. There's no room for error. It's as simple as clicking. And one of them is for my upcoming membership, which I have said is upcoming for many, many, many months. <laughs> you know? um, and currently it's still finding its form. Um, but I have something in the super signature for that. And I now have 265 new leads in the last month for that paying nothing just from that super signature to people who have just signed up for the mailing list. So yeah. they opted in and then they opted in again. And sometimes all you have to do is just give them the opportunity. So that's where nurturing just really changes the game, I think, especially for permission campaigns. Absolutely. And this is kind of going back to something that we were talking about a little earlier when it comes to structuring tests. Um, when you structure a test, for example, and you're saying to yourself, I want to pull a hundred leads into this, into this opt-in campaign, this permission campaign first to see how mm -hmm. it does. It gives you that ability to look at maybe not all of the portions of the nurturing, but it allows you to see, okay, of those hundred people that are going through, you know, going through my experience, going through the content nurturing that comes with this offer, what's happening in there? How are they right. engaging with it? Is that, is it cool? Is it working? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? And what I usually recommend to people, um, and this is something that's just as kind of like a little sneak peek for you guys, uh, mm -hmm. something that's going to be inside of permission marketing for musicians, uh, is a little SOP on what we call like a postmortem analysis. What's and an you can SOP? An SOP is a standard operating procedure. Um, it's just it basically a check. Super trendy. <laughs> it's a checklist. It's a checklist of things that you can do and follow to accomplish a particular task. That's probably you know, the simplest, simplest definition. <laughs> what's funny about that is that the army uses SOP constantly. Everything yeah. in the army is SOP'd. Everything has a uh, user manual. The basic user manual is called the Dash Ten, right? Which is actually why my band was named Dash Ten for a while. Um, and so when I got out of the military, I was trying to be really cognizant of jargon and acronyms that I was using from the military <laughs> and I didn't even, so I wouldn't say SOP, you know, that's so and funny. So I was, this is more in the beginning of the company, but I was talking to Circa about like, oh, we should develop like manuals, you know, like checklists for each thing. He's like, oh, like an SOP. And I was like, 
Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, so I'm very sensitive to acronyms. So that's why I just had to ask you to that's clarify so that. <laughs> that's so fun. That's so funny. And I mean, maybe it's a, it might be a word that a lot of indies haven't used. It's widely used in the it's widely used in the business world, but yeah, I'm not um, trying to insult anyone's intelligence. I just never assume that yeah. <laughs> anyone's going to know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, but there is going to be a little SOP inside of this training on what we call a postmortem analysis. And basically what you can Ooh. use that for is, yeah, once you've got those 100 leads into this, you could continue running the campaign. You know, if it's doing really well, I'm not encouraging you to shut it off, but you can use it to analyze what happened with that first cohort of people. And in this right. SOP, we, we kind of just lay out the questions you should be asking yourself about the test. You know, things like what were the goals of the test? How many subscribers did you bring in? What was the cost? What were your conversion rates looking like? How were, you know, the more intangible things uh, about the test working? You know, how, how was the engagement? Were you getting a lot of email replies, for example? Um, what kind of difficulties did you have in the campaign creation process? Did you find issues with particular uh, versions of your ad copy, particular creatives that didn't resonate with people, all of these sorts of things. Um, just something that you can kind of put into your own workflow and use time and time again, adapt it to, to how you want to um, use it. But it's something that we use often at IndieX and, you know, just widely at Entrepreneur. We do, we do postmortems on a lot of things, <laughs> yeah. um, even, even on our own promotions. So I, I think that great. it'll be a re yeah, I think that it'll be a really useful tool. I'm excited for that because it's same thing, right? I know I always talk about founder. Can you tell I love my founders? But in that same uh, worksheet that I was talking about where we're evaluating, you know, if something's gonna be profitable or not and, you know, how the mailing list impacts that. In that same worksheet, we also are calculating all these things based on educated guesses of what your cost per view is, what your cost per opt-in is, what, you know, and we just have to guess. With grassroots yeah. artists who've never done this stuff, they're just like, I don't know. <laughs> and yep. so we will estimate very high, which is why a lot of them are like, oh my gosh, this isn't gonna be profitable because they have no data to know like, okay, what is my average cost per lead over all of the campaigns I've run for leads? What is my average cost per 75% video view over all these campaigns you know, that I've run? So they're guessing and we like to guess high so that we can prepare ourselves for the worst case scenario. So all of this data not only gives you information to you know potentially pivot and keep the things that worked well, throw away the things that didn't work well, but it also allows you to budget for things that you have upcoming, right? We have so many indies ask questions about how much should I put aside for a fan finder? How much should I put aside for this? And it's like, it totally depends because we don't know your costs. We also don't know what your objectives are, what you want to accomplish. So not knowing right. those two things is like, I don't know. But if you right. are doing a post-mortem analysis and you make notes of all of these things where you've been running campaigns, then you know how to make educated guesses about this and determine that for yourself, which again, we're all about teaching you to figure it out and not needing us to tell you, or you just pay us for consults every week and you wouldn't ever be able to do this on your own. It would cost you a million dollars. So um, I'm for actually sure. really excited to see that tool because I think, I think it'll help a lot of indies realize how powerful success and failure both are in making you better at marketing your music. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, something that I go over in that specific training is when you're filling out that postmortem sheet, once you're done, you analyze the answers and you say to yourself, okay, what patterns am I seeing here? What patterns am I finding with regards to the variables that I was testing? And based on those, you know, you look at what are the big things that I could change? What are the more nitty gritty things that I can change? And then what, you know, educated decision do I make when it comes to starting to making, you know, a, a change or a tweak to a campaign and then continuing to run it. So totally. that could be, that could be if you're, if you knocked it out of the park and it's just crushing, that right. might be, Oh, you know, like my email open rates could be a little better. Let me tweak my subject lines. You know, that's like nitty right. gritty stuff. Right. If it's, if it's, Oh man, my cost per lead was too high. I don't think my fans are totally understanding what my offer is. Then it's, 
you know, that could be a full blown copy revamp across your ads, landing pages, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's bigger and more broad. A po doing a postmortem on a 100 leads test can give you that kind of objectivity to zoom out and be like, all right, where are the real issues here based right. on, you know, an actual cohort of people rather than just like two or three days of ads. So I think that it's going to be really cool. I'm super stoked about it. Yeah, so powerful. And if you're interested in that, the permission marketing training is actually going to be out, I think, probably a few weeks because we are just getting ready to launch the selling tickets update, selling tickets for live shows, which I know you're like selling tickets, but lots of indies want to develop these audiences in, ahead of trying to tour to an, to a specific market. So, uh, and there's a lot in that training. It's basic, it's a complete yes. redo. The selling tickets training is as it is now is going to be a hundred percent replaced with this amazing work by Jesse. And I'm super stoked for that to be up. And then permission training, which will be available to pro members only at first um, before we open it up to everyone. But uh, I'm really excited to see everything you've put together, Jack, because just based on the last few episodes, like it's going to crush. <laughs> I'm pretty stoked on it. I'm excited too. I can't wait. Yeah. We'll be back next week on Creative Juice. Let's go.